Well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to the organizers. Thanks to the participants for joining. I'm just writing down the, the title of my talk. And I can understand that perhaps these words sound a bit strange. Um, I mean, words not being really um, comprehensible or, or uh, one is curious for their meaning. And that is, of course, what I will explain. Um, but I must also admit that there is a certain um, will, I mean, a certain happiness even to, to speak about some things which are maybe not always emphasized in this project, which is called uh, stochastic thermodynamics. When a workshop on stochastic thermodynamics, I'm neither working nor shopping in, in stochastic uh, thermodynamics, but I, I still wanted to start with, with some basic remark about this, this enterprise. You know, I'm partially also, I believe people tell me, I'm partially also responsible uh, for stochastic thermodynamics because say in the period 1999, 2003, I have been um, writing papers where I explained how uh, one can understand this so-called galavotti cohen type fluctuation theorems, all kinds of version of it, due to the fact that as I wrote then also, um, if one has a dynamical system or a stochastic dynamical system and one looks at the ratio of the probability of a trajectory versus the, the time reversed trajectory, probability of the time reversed trajectory, that very often, and that is basically called the condition of local detail balance, one can identify that with the uh, physical entropy flux into the reservoir. So the time antisymmetric part, if you wish, of the probability of trajectories can be identified with the entropy flux. And that in after one or two lines gives you fluctuation theorem and um, various aspects related to the time antisymmetric fluctuation sector of, of non-equilibrium systems. Now, since there is a time antisymmetric fluctuation sector, there must also exist a time symmetric fluctuation sector. And that is what I'm speaking about today. So it is this aspect of frenzy and frenetic steering that will involve, um, instead of the entropic or dissipative or time antisymmetric aspect of the non-equilibrium system, it will be related to the time symmetric aspect of the fluctuation sector. Okay, so let me start by um, somehow explain the, the meaning of it all and or, or maybe say a bit, give a bit of context of uh, what are we talking about. Um, so if we speak about steering in particular, um, you know, uh, we should have in mind things like we are sitting at the steering wheel, we try to control, we try to manipulate uh, the architecture or the system components to go in a wide sense, in a certain direction. Now, um, that has, of course, been entertained, that idea, in, in various ways. So let me say that there is a step one, or the primitive step in that, in that way of doing things, is just to use the existing uh, potential differences that are available at any, one, at any moment. So what do I mean by that? Well, I mean just the idea of, um, I guess in English you call it a, a marble run. Uh, so what I mean is that you, you make a kind of uh, trajectory um, and you're using, say here in gravity, there is a certain height, you have your particle, your marble, and it just runs down because of the potential difference. So in other words, um, you're using this gravity here or this potential difference in more generally to steer the particle. And what is fun uh, and what I often did as a kid was somehow to make a way for the marbles uh, to find uh, ground level. And um, somehow you can also start to be more inventive here. You can select, you have the big marbles and you have the small marbles and you can somehow steer them uh, depending on how you manage to make that road, that run, uh, runway for, for your marbles. So that is somehow the, what we, in, with a more complicated word, these marble runs, we, do, we call that today gradient flow. So gradient flow is, is nothing more than um, 
using in general, say, free energy differences or energy differences. It's, it's really an, ener an energetic steering um, towards the, the goal and thereby you can do all kinds of selections um, where the initial condition is at a higher energetic level, say, or a free energetic level and via boundary conditions, possibly via the landscape that you have built building for your run runway, you um, get a particular outcome um, and a particular steering of, of what is happening. So in fact, if we look at um, the idea of um, neural networks or all the way to what today is called machine learning or deep learning, it uses that idea. I'm not going to enter into the full details now, but probably um, one very important example that um, made very explicit also how statistical equilibrium statistical mechanics is, is helping here is, of course, the Hopfield model, already 40 years old by now, where um, what you basically are doing is, is building a landscape in energy, uh, which is, of course, the same thing as a free energy at low temperature, where you associating parameters or other patterns to the local minima. And if you uh, think of them as like, this is a cat, this is a dog, this is a horse, then giving a kind of more blurred picture of a cat would say, put you somewhere here on the landscape, uphill, not quite in the minimum. And basically what you're doing is to give a dynamics, which is gradient flow along that free energy to hit the ideal platonic cat. And then we have well, association, we have pattern um, recovery. So the, the Hopfield model is just an explicit interacting spin system where the coupling parameters, maybe I can as well write it down. So we have a Hamiltonian, which depends on the spins, but also on the patterns. So these are the the usual kind of easing spins. It's a mean field easing type model, and these are the patterns. And this Hamiltonian is of the following uh, mean field um, structure. So you sum over all the sides in a graph, think of it as a, as a square lattice or so, and you are uh, doing the usual easing construction that you multiply the spin at i and the spin at j, that's sigma i, sigma j. But you have now a coupling between all these ij's, so a symmetric coupling ij, which depends on the patterns. So in particular, this jij, uh, that's called the Hebbian rule, um, will be somewhat like a sum over the, the say, p patterns, where you're um, counting them also as having components i and j. So xi mu, there are mu is running from one of p, is a pattern, which is basically a collection of, of bits again, um, uh, which tries to, um, which, which corresponds to these minima in the, in the free energy landscape. And these binary patterns, they are kind of the goal of the gradient flow for a dynamics, which is basically energetically steered by this Hopfield Hamiltonian. And that can be extended, I mean, not for one layer, but this can be extended to so-called layered, uh, how they call it, layered or hierarchical associative uh, memory networks. But it's all the time using uh, the idea of going down using a cost function or a free energy landscape or an energy landscape and minimizing it like you're doing in, um, in a kind of a gradient flow usually to find the minima, which will have a certain stability, certainly at, at low temperature. So that's in general, what I would call the primitive step in steering is to just use like, you know, you don't do any, you use the interactions, you use the, the available energy differences, you use gravity like you do for the marble run to, to, to steer yourself to the minima of the free energy. There is a step two which was taken much earlier, but these are the, that's like um, using fire. Um, just like Prometheus was able to start cooking um, and do applied thermodynamics. We learned basically from another poet, Sadi Carnot, uh, about the, the power or the puissance, the, the film of the, somehow the power of fire. 
to make heat engines, to make real machines. And there you already add, in fact, non-equilibrium. It's mostly uh, you consider in the Carnot cycle, say, reversible limits, but at least the idea is there of taking, for example, via um, temporal, I mean, in, uh, changes in time, you know, potentials that depend on time, for example, effectively adding rotational forces to get um, work being done, for example, by a machine. And that non-equilibrium driving, well, perhaps can help you also to, um, to find back certain pat patterns. And um, last week, uh, I think it was last week, I guess, yeah, I, I was in a workshop also in Trieste on um, a very interesting workshop on signals of life. Let me abbreviate the title as such. And there was also a talk there by uh, Suri um, Vaikutanathan, um, where he was telling us about the enhancement of this associative memory recall that you, for example, have in the Hopfield model by adding non-equilibrium driving. So you know that if you have this easing type models like the Hopfield model, you can make, well, stochastic easing model, you can have a detailed balance dynamics with it that generates you this dynamics where you do the gradient flow. But one can, in the spirit of adding non-equilibrium, have the pattern still stored energetically, but perhaps hope that by adding non-equilibrium forces, rotational forces, so homo adding, adding fire, that you can effectively deepen the wells, make them more stable, and get to them more, more rapidly. And that is what uh, Suri was talking about. And you can still find his um, talk online if you're interested in, in that. So that's like, instead of energetic steering with these ideas of, uh, let me call them in general, making machines using extra fire and non-equilibrium, as Suri was explaining last week also, um, you get from energetic steering into what I would call entropic or dissipative steering, where you hope that the non-equilibrium driving or activity also will somehow effectively deepen the wells and you can perhaps reach them even faster. What I will be speak about today is somehow taking uh, it all the way. Um, and that is what I would call a, a a third step where the steering will be frenetic. So I have to explain that. Um, so, so far, if you could follow me a little bit, so far you have seen that the patterns, you know, the cat, the dog, the, the horse, whatever, these are called the ideal patterns, they are stored as minima of energy or as minima of free energy and you reach them somehow, or you want to reach them as fast as possible. But the patterns are stored as coupling parameters, basically, or in the potential, in the self-energy or in the interaction potential. That's where the patterns are sitting. So what I now would like to do is to quite change that idea and to store the patterns, not in the energy, not in the free energy, not in coupling parameters, but to store them in time symmetric dynamical activity parameters or in, in reactivities. So um, that sounds still a bit mysterious perhaps, but let me start with a, with a very elementary example just to announce the idea. I mean, it will be very, very uh, simple. So I invite you to consider a, a random walk. So which is, um, uh, just a random walk, a very simple random walk, in fact, on the ring. So think about the ring with, um, okay, I have sites on my ring, maybe I have n sites, so I have periodic boundary conditions. I have here, say, a site, um, let me call it uh, x, and here I have the site x plus one. So I go clockwise here. And the random walker is, um, is, is, is steered a little bit. And how can you steer this random walker? So it starts somewhere. So I have to specify the transition rate. So what I have to specify to you is the transition rate uh, in continuous time 
to go to jump hop from x to x plus one and uh, i also will have to uh, specify uh, the rate to go from x to x uh, or maybe i will write it like I will do from X plus one to X, so in the opposite direction. Okay, so let me take a specific choice here. Um, and I uh, can imagine that to every X there is associated some energy. So perhaps I have, uh, okay, uh, something like which would do the, would do the, 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 the detail balance then. So I will have an, an energy difference here, right? And here it would be the opposite. And beta would be the inverse temperature. And um, probably if I divide by two this thing, I hope you can read it, um, you will recognize this as a standard detailed balance dynamics for obtaining a Boltzmann distribution for the states on the ring, where you get a canonical ensemble, namely the probability to have a stationary, to, a stationary probability to be an X is just given by e to the minus beta that energy function. So in other words, if the energy is very, if the temperature is sufficiently large, sorry, if the beta is sufficiently large, you will typically sit in the minimum of the energy, right? So that is kind of clear. But now let us add here an, um, a driving. Since we are on the ring, it's quite easy to add a driving and let me take the amplitude to be epsilon. So in that sense, if I go from X to X plus one, I will have here maybe, um, I will add here an epsilon uh, over two, and here I will have a minus epsilon over t. Don't look at the over one over two, it's not important. But epsilon is a constant, and in fact, in this case, you will have that, um, no, there is a bias to go to the right, right? But still, somehow, the energy, and certainly at low temperature, will be dominating uh, the system here. And um, even though uh, you may be a bit faster in, in searching the landscape, um, you will still reach the minima of the potential, basically, of the energy. But now let's do something different. Let us now um, forget for the moment about energy. We could, for, we, could, we could use it or not use it, but let me make it simpler and let us assume that I am still having a bias, say, to go clockwise, but here I just add something that depends on X. And for the opposite transition, I have minus epsilon over two, but I have the same AX. In other words, if I look at the AX here and here, they are the same. So the bond, it is really the bond which is characterized by a certain width or depth. I don't know how you want to call it, but it's time symmetric. Whether you cross the bond clockwise or counterclockwise, you have the same AX. Still you're biased, but still there is the AX. Now if AX, would be the same for every X. Of course, the probability uh, would be uh, rotation invariant and independent of epsilon, you would have one over N as the probability of a certain side. But now suppose that epsilon is sufficiently big and we ask when or where will now be the stationary distribution. But it turns out that a simple calculation tells you that the stationary probability density to land in X will go like one over AX. In other words, you get that if you are in non-equilibrium, you can start to select the most dominant state. I mean, the ground state, if I can use equilibrium statistical mechanics language, you will be dominated. The stationary distribution will be sitting exactly there where it is basically the smallest escape rate. So you will have one over AX. So while this example is sufficiently simple um, to contemplate, it, it is teaching us a lesson. Namely, it teaches us that from the moment we are in non-equilibrium and in fact far from equilibrium, as we can imagine, say for biological systems, I mean, living life functioning would require that. Once we are there, we have another parameter to play with. We have this time symmetric reactivities to play with, and in fact, can be used to select where you will go with your dynamics, where you will go in the sense that the stationary distribution will have to be at the place where the AX is, is minimal. Allow me till to add that if we would have epsilon equal to zero, so in detail balance, 
it would be completely irrelevant, this, this AX, as long as it is not zero, the probabilities of all the states would be identical. It doesn't matter whether you have a profile of AX when you are detailed balance, you wouldn't see it. It's only when you're far from equilibrium that it really starts to dominate the stationary condition. Okay, so now that is, let's say, the, the main idea where we have to, for, for frenetic steering. So frenetic steering is basically the following, that you are going to store patterns in these reactivities, in this time symmetric components, to end up where you want to end up. And this here is just an example about the stationary condition, but that is just one example. The same implies, in fact, to the full probability of of a trajectory as we had it in the beginning, because the probability of omega is not only governed by this uh, entropy fluxes, but is also governed by, this is a minus sign, by another time symmetric aspect of the trajectory, which is the time symmetric aspect, and that is called the frenzy. All right, so let us be, um, even though the time is also running in one direction, let us be a little bit more specific and complicate matters just slightly. Okay, so if I'd, we, say, I'd say you've got another 10 minutes. I have another 10 minutes, wonderful. So if we speak about steering, then classical particles, the best way to steer them is of course to speak about forces. So we will apply forces to steer the particles, but what forces will, where do they come from? We will not do it like in the primitive step by using gravity or free energy or something like that, but we will use it. We will use another force. We will use the statistical force. Namely, we think of a probe or think about a particle with a certain position at time t, which is xt, which is coupled. I mean, these the lines are just imaginary ways of uh, fantasy ways of denoting the fact that this is coupled to other degrees of freedom which I will call in general having configuration eta, which is also depending on time t. And this configuration eta t is supposed to be, let me say, in the first instance, much faster on a much faster time scale than the position is changing of the probe. So that invites them the idea of a statistical force f of x, which would be the following. Suppose I have an interaction potential between the probe position x and the configuration of spins eta. So think about this being the position of the probe. And let us think of eta as spins, spin configuration. Well, if it is much faster, the spin configuration, there may be a stationary distribution living on the etas, which depends on the position of the probe because they are coupled. So I can integrate that and take here the nabla of X like we do in mechanics. So this is just the mechanical force, but I average over the spin environment. So I take, I repeat, a mechanical force averaged over the spin environment. And that defines for me an induced mean force, statistical mean force it is on the probe. So that force is now what I will use as a steering thing. So the idea is now the following. If you are in equilibrium, so in equilibrium, let me remind you, when the rho x stationary is just, in fact, a canonical ensemble with certain temperature, then this fx, uh, in that case, fx is, in fact, a gradient of the free energy, of the free energy parameterized by the position of x, where the free energy is the logarithm of this partition function, essentially. I think that is well known. So in equilibrium, statistical force is the mean statistical force is just the gradient is always derived from a potential and in particular from a free energy. However, if the etas are satisfying a non-equilibrium stationary distribution, so if the dynamics is non-equilibrium, then this thermodynamic, this statistical force will, well, just like, I mean, why not? It will have a gradient of something which I call here H, H in honor of Helmholtz, who was one of the first to uh, consider such decompositions of a force in a gradient part and in a rotational part. And there will be a force which we will call maybe the non-equilibrium part of the st statistical force on the probe. And now comes the point, the statistical force, the non-equilibrium part 
will in fact be non-zero only if there is a non-trivial frenzy. So that was explained in, and here it is good time for giving a, a reference. So if you look at the paper that together with Karl Netochny, we published in the journal Chaos, it's um, in 2019 already. Then uh, this is explained how the non-equilibrium part, so the rotational part in the statistical force essentially depends on the frenzy. And by that, I mean the following, if there is no frenzy, there would be no non-equilibrium force. And if there, this frenzy is not somehow, not independent of the dissipation, I mean, in the sense that it is not slave of the dissipation, in the sense that you are far enough from equilibrium, not just in linear order around equilibrium. If it is, in other words, a non-trivial frenzy, which you can handle independently from the entropy fluxes, then this rotational part will exist. And moreover, whatever is parameterized by the frenzy, you can use to steer that colloid because you can start to steer the rotational part. So it also means that you can generate currents. So the extra thing that happens if you do steering in a non-equilibrium environment is that not only do you able to reach your preferred state by changing your dynamical activity or reactivity, but you also have an extra tool. You can now store patterns like cats, dogs, and horses, not only as being static, a particular state of your system, but also in currents. So you can have clockwise current to mean a cat and counterclockwise uh, current to mean a horse. In other words, the non-equilibrium not only allows you to use the frenzy and the frenetic parameters to steer, but also um, to have your patterns to be encoded, not as static states, conditions, but also to have them uh, encoded via currents. So a first paper we wrote about that was in collaboration with uh, Bram Lefebvre. Um, and that you can consult in Journal of Statistical Physics 2023, so this, this year, where the first idea of this frenetic steering was, was applied to select um, basically states, not currents yet, but to select states by encoding the, the patterns in the frenetic components. So if you want to know the details, I would recommend that you would look perhaps at, at, at this reference to understand a basic idea of what it means to store patterns in, in, the, in the reactivities or in the dynamical activity. Now, you will see also that these uh, models that are represented there are not quite yet in the range of what we would call associative memory or in the sense of um, recovery or uh, remembering or uh, pattern recognition, but more in the sense of, um, well, encoding the pattern or somehow. But what we are doing right now in the same sense is that we are um, doing the idea that I explained here of putting the, the patterns that you want to teach, you put it in the frenzy to generate rotational forces, which give rise to various currents. In other words, the signal, uh, the, the, the patterns were no or no associated to, um, how can I say, current structures or particular currents. And these currents are obtained in the following sense that the, the frenzy and the reactivities are functions of the particular spin configuration that you have, but also of the patterns. Psi, if you remember these Hopfield patterns, in such a way that if your initial eta is sufficiently close to a given pattern, then it is steered towards a current which is corresponding to this particular pattern. So that is, uh, I think, all I want to say. Well, I, I would like to say more, but I mean, this is basically the summary of the idea of frenetic steering that I wanted um, to give today as a kind of... Um, new recipe or a new algorithm, if you wish, countering or complementing the more traditional energetic or dissipative uh, gradient flow-like associative memory 
that one is using uh, with enormously with enormous successes, of course, starting with the perceptron all the way to neural networks and machine learning. Uh, but which I believe is more relevant for biological systems. It would be hard for me to believe that um, my brain, for example, would use um, free energy, would use detailed balance gradient flow dynamics for uh, storing or remembering patterns. Rather, I would believe that there is a background of non-equilibrium, a given epsilon like we had it before, a given driving which is always there, and that allows the patterns or whatever you have learned to be stored in information, which is not so much thermodynamic, but which is kinetic. In other words, sits in all kinds of reactivities rather than is stored energetically or um, free energetically as we usually have it uh, in the in the paradigm of, of neural networks. I think uh, I think I said enough, but perhaps I can answer some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we haven't, I don't think anyone has um, posted a question in the chat so far. So could we, anyone who's got a question, could you raise your hand and an emphasis on um, junior people? Um, having a go. Um, I'm looking at the list of positives. Someone's raised a hand. Who's raised the hands? Tarek, why don't you go ahead? A really interesting talk. I'd have to uh, really dive into the details, but like the obvious naive question, I guess, is how would you train currents based on data, just like you train you know, free energy-based yeah. neural networks. Well, for the more, that's of, indeed, there are always two parts, as you um, so well uh, emphasize here. There are always two parts to this story. There is the, the idea of training, which are of different types possibly, and there is the idea of recovering or remembering, right? So there is the training and there is the, uh, the recognition step. So for the moment, it is true that we have been somehow more um, emphasized, obsessed by the, the recollection and by the training. So for the moment, our training is basically the most naive training that you can imagine, namely trial and error. It just means the following. You start, you know, you should take a bit of an abstract framework here. You have a, non you have a graph with loops and all that. So it's a big graph. And now you have a random walker, which is walking on that graph. And you um, start by, you, you start in a particular vertex, say, which corresponds to a spin configuration, and it starts to walk. And now you are going to see what it's doing, and you're going to increase or decrease certain reactivities. So from seeing where it goes. And the next time you have a random walker to do that, it will profit from the previous experience. So there is a training set of trajectories that you're using. So basically, you take a sample of trajectories one by one, one after the other. So it's a supervised learning. And you are going to change after each trajectory the reactivities so that it behaves better, so that it will enter a particular loop. And there is where the current is sitting. So the loop is just, sorry, the loop is carrying a current. So you have a loop in a graph, it carries a current, and it stands, I mean, at least in our imagination, it stands for a particular pattern. Because now you see, in, as I said, in non-equilibrium, you're able to associate now patterns, not only with just a vertex in your graph or a particular spin configuration, but you're also able to associate a pattern with a loop, which is a, a kind of, um, okay, it's just a dynamical aspect, no? And, and so you would like to have the learning in such a way that for certain pictures that is, are presented, you guide your graph to have an architecture in terms of the reactivities, which are time symmetric towards that loop. Okay, so th these are all the verbal things. I mean, the proof is in the eating, of course, but that is what we do with, with training, with supervised training, where we just sample trajectories and we just make uh, our graph better in terms of what we see that happens. It's, it's just hard for me to imagine how you evaluate whether or not the Okay. network has entered the pattern that you would okay. like okay so you, there are there is of course the, there is the, you have to have parameterization so what we do is what we that we want to have that it happens fast and that you stay there for a long time okay so these are the criteria 
So you fix a particular timing that, okay, has uh, another logic, but there is a certain time that you want to say, I want to reach that pattern by this time, and I want to stay there for at least that time. And that are the parameters. And if that is not happening, it could be too big or too low, then you adjust your reactivities. So it's a parameterized learning, of course. Okay, let's let's move on to the next question. Uh, Peter Ryan's just popped out for a second, so we've got time for a couple of questions. John, I think your hand was up next. Hmm. Well, yeah, sorry. Um, so th that's really interesting. I was wondering if um, uh, there's there's another example where you have uh, a dynamical pattern stored, which is parametric resonance, where you excite at some frequency f, and you were to response at half that frequency f over two. So there are two phases of the response. And so each oscillator can store uh, uh, one bit kind of information in which phase, and then you can have n of them. And people use that actually to, um, you know, to, 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 to store information and solve problems. And I was wondering, if, does that enter into the, how, how does that? I, see, I, I, I must admit, I am uh, very ignorant in that. I didn't know that, but that sounds indeed uh, one aspect. I mean, we are not doing parametric, para, parametric resonance, of course. Um, because we are using statistical mechanics, basically. Right, right. But indeed, I can imagine that uh, you can store information in, in little currents or in loops or in uh, oscillations or not. I mean, that is not so strange. Um, it just, for us, as an extra that is natural when you do non-equilibrium. Um, you see, mm -hmm. it's if you have just detailed balance, you will not generate currents, never. You, the only thing you can do is to steer towards a particular behavior, which corresponds to a stationary distribution, which is parameterized by the energy. Non-equilibrium just allows you also to store in currents in a very natural way. But I, I, the idea of, of storing patterns in, okay, dynamical patterns, I, as you just said, indeed, I, I can imagine that this is also something that people have been using and it not necessarily lines up with ideas of non-equilibrium, but okay, for example, parametric resonance. Um, sure, sure. Okay, okay. Uh, Long Him. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, so uh, you mentioned in talk that uh, the times anti-symmetric part will be related to entropy and time symmetric part is related to the frenzy. So for the entropy, we have like, uh, general expression like the Shannon entropy or the heat exchange with the heat bath to like uh, a, a good formula to calculate the entropy. Is there any a general expression for us to theoretically calculate the frenzy? Yes, the answer is yes. Um, but it is true that it is um, somewhat, it is non-thermodynamic, right? So it's not that you find something immediately related to thermodynamic quantities. It's not related immediately indeed to heat or entropy fluxes like you would have with the time, with the time antisymmetric part. But now you can of course do the exercise and you can uh, start with your favorite non-equilibrium models. I hope those that make some sense and you can indeed explicitly calculate this uh, frenzy. Now, I do not know by heart um, references, but if you would go to my to my homepage, um, there is, um, I wrote a kind of review article about frenzy, and there you find all kinds of models um, where you calculate the time symmetric part, just like you can calculate the time anti-symmetric part, you can calculate the time symmetric part, and what you find, say for Markov jump processes, is that this frenzy is um, related, as I was saying, um, to escape rates. Um, so escape rates are basically related to how long you wait until you leave a room, right? So this waiting time is, this, is a quiescence, which is uh, certainly time symmetric. I mean, if you wait in your trajectory, in the forward trajectory, if you wait a certain moment, well, if you reverse the trajectory, you will also have the same waiting time. So escape rates belong to frenzy, but other things which in general we can call dynamical activity. So basically, as I was saying for the ring, these activity parameters that are related to the link, to the bond, in a time symmetric way, and which we can call the, the, the traffic also, or the activity, the time symmetric activity, 
that is what enters uh, the frenzy. I mean, the, the first applications of this idea of frenzy were in response theory. You see, if you do um, response theory, linear response theory around equilibrium, this is a fluctuation dissipation relation that you're getting. So basically, you get that the observable must be seen in correlation with the excess in dissipation. That correlation gives you the linear response around equilibrium. If you do linear response around non-equilibrium, this fluctuation dissipation relation is violated. But on the positive side, you can understand how it is violated by introducing this, this frenzy. So if you do linear response around non-equilibrium uh, conditions, you will find that, for example, the mobility is no longer given by purely the diffusion in your original model, but it will also be related to a correlation between the current and the dynamical activity. It means, for example, instead of, you know, current is like number of steps in a particular direction. It's, it's, a, it's an oriented current, right? If we speak about current, but you can also look at the traffic, which is just not caring whether you go to the right or to the left. So that's an activity, it's a traffic. Well, if you do response theory around non-equilibrium, say for random walks in non-equilibrium, then you will find that there is an extra frenetic contribution to the response, which is encoded in the coupling between the current and that activity, and not only the current with the entropy. So that's where the frenzy enters. And all what we are doing in frenetic steering is somehow using that response to turn the system around. Then, namely, we, if by knowing the response, we can start to steer the particle. And that gives us the frenetic steering I was talking about. I'm going to have to butt in here. That was a, some very yeah. extensive answers um, to those questions. Um, Jin Wang, I'm afraid I'm going to have to move on. But if you, you have possibly... any questions, you can always email me and I will be very happy to answer. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Christian. Thank you. Uh, we thank now you. have uh, Peter Ryan Tenwalder, who, um, Peter Ryan, if you can share your screen. Here we go. Okay. Um, so welcome, and uh, we await your talk on optimal finite time copying. We can't hear you at the moment if you're talking. 